name is Kimberly Blaze and I'm the founder of Mama Makes Games and today I'd like to talk about how to make game development a more diverse and globally inclusive practice. My journey to making games came late in life. I grew up in Eugene, Oregon during the 1970s and 80s when games were mainly played in arcades and on consoles like the Atari 2600. This was back when the video game industry really became huge with millions and millions of players. In fact, by 1980, the video game industry was worth tens of billions of dollars annually. To put that into perspective, that's about the same size as the gaming industry is now, minus mobile games. Just like today, in the 1980s, video games were making more money than the music and movie industries combined. And, just like today, video games were primarily being developed by young, affluent, white, and East Asian men. Gaming is equally popular among women and men across all races and throughout every socioeconomic class. So then why is game development so skewed toward young white men? When I was 10, I spent a year in Africa with my mother, stepfather, and sister while my mother did research for her master's degree, and my stepfather worked as an anthropologist. That experience led to me being very interested in people and cultures that were different than my own, and eventually I got my bachelor's degree in anthropology. One of the things that I find most fascinating within anthropology is how people learn and adapt their cultures. As a result, I went on to get my master's degree in education, and about 10 years ago, I co-founded an educational software company to try to broaden access to educational technology. In that company, I was involved in inventing new ways to create content, like online courses and visual models of ideas. But what really ignited my passion was when we started looking at games as an educational medium. In fact, this was so exciting that I decided to start a small indie game company. I began a project called The Lost Weld. After a few months of very intense development, I created a 45-minute prototype using Unreal Engine. I'm glad you're here, daughter. Things have taken a turn for the worse, and we are running out of time. What's happened, mother? Oh, oh, Piper, it's you. While I sought to find a publisher who would take a chance on a female solo developer like me, I decided to make a game that was very specific to my own personal experiences. I was a 17-year-old teenage girl living in Oregon in 1988. Strangely enough, my latest game, Hellfire 1988, an Oregon story, is told from the point of view of a 17-year-old teenage girl living in Oregon in 1988. Hellfire 1988 is a hybrid visual novel, point-and-click adventure game. But what makes it unusual isn't just its hybrid genre. The perspective I can bring as a game developer to this particular game is very different from someone who doesn't have the kind of personal, lived experience I had as a teenager. But of course, my perspective is only one of millions of radically different lived experiences with radically different stories to express. What is keeping us from hearing all of these different stories? The gaming industry is notoriously bad at anticipating change, with industry pundits and experts continually underestimating the success of new entrants from Asteroids to Pac-Man, Nintendo to SimCity, Candy Crush to Fortnite. Again and again, the industry's gatekeepers say the same thing. No one wants anything different. So it isn't surprising that this supposed wisdom means that publishers and corporate executives keep cranking out the same type of games from the same type of developers year after year. We're living in a world where only 1% of human beings are allowed to speak. Just 1% get to communicate, teach, argue, express, and participate in the shared conversation. Although anthropologically speaking, the creation of games could be a tipping point for cross-cultural understanding and respect. The only voices most gamers will ever hear are from the same narrow band of white, middle to upper class Western male experiences, just like when I was a kid. Why is this? The answer is likely complex, including biases in STEM education, corporate bro culture, and game industry labor practices that are incompatible with family responsibilities. But since access to the technology and training to create games has become more available to broader demographics over the past decade, shouldn't we now see more women, more people from the global south, more diversity in creating games? 
My experiences this past year as an indie developer creating my own games, including The Lost Weld, Bridge of Dawn, Robolingo, Brimo, and now Hellfire 1988, have all led me to the same conclusion. Expanding game development to more diverse demographics is chiefly constrained by the overly technical and industry-focused emphasis of game development tools. Consider this. When I was a kid, working on photographs with computers was a highly technical, professional practice. Over the years, the tools and traditions for editing and processing photos grew more and more complex. If you wanted to broaden the field of digital photography beyond affluent white and Asian men, Giving more people access to Photoshop would only marginally expand the field. Photoshop is not only a very complex program, but it also reflects the conventions and expectations of a long-established professional industry. But what happened when Instagram and similar programs made photo editing easy and accessible? Instagram was not designed for professional photographers. It was designed for regular people. But suddenly, millions of people were cropping, applying filters, adjusting exposure, and more because they had a program that was designed for everyone rather than industry norms. This has happened with creating web pages, videos, e-commerce, and more. And what's most ironic is that some of these changes have resulted in professionals now copying the amateurs, creating the YouTuber look or the selfie. The tipping point was reached. We need the same thing in the most powerful medium technology has yet created. Games and other interactive media are the frontier of cultural creativity. But as long as their development tools are focused on the industry professionals, we will only hear from 1% of humanity. I believe that the world needs to hear from more than just 1% of people. In fact, I want to hear everyone's voice. Hopefully game technology companies will create more accessible tools so everyone can express themselves with games. But I'm not going to wait for them. I've decided that I'm going to make my own tool, one that everyone can use from all different walks of life and we'll be able to hear the stories and the ideas from a totally different perspective with this new tool. And once I make it, I'd like to share it with you. Thanks for listening.